Hey everyone and welcome to another video guys and today I'm going to be breaking down the climb all the way from Diamond 4 right through to Challenger. Now in order to really do this video justice I must get into the details. I got to get very specific, very granular into the nitty gritty otherwise you guys watching this, you aren't going to get much value. Now, in order to get very specific, I've actually had to break down the climb into specific skill brackets. And for those of you who've actually made this climb before, you will know that there's no such thing as randomly going from like Diamond 4 right through to Diamond 1 or Diamond 1 right through to 500 LP. There was like this miniature test along the way that you must pass as you climb up and make this massive journey all the way from Diamond to Challenger. Now, I want to preface this video by saying... This is all made based off my own experiences climbing to Challenger over the past six or seven seasons, as well as through my own coaching experiences and coaching clients within the Midland Academy, as well as coaching clients over the past year and a half. So this is just my own theory and what I've seen coaching and doing it myself. Now, in order to better explain this theory and basically what I'm going to be covering today, I've got a little bit of a diagram here or a mountain analogy that really helps you uh, kind of see what we're going to be covering today. Now, I'm only going to be covering uh, Diamond 2. This is actually Diamond 2, this little red line here. Sorry, Diamond 4. Diamond 4 all the way to around 800 LP Challenger. Okay, I'm not going to be covering anything below Diamond 4. So this Platinum to do uh, Platinum 2 to Diamond 4 bracket, I'm not going to be covering. And then anything below Platinum 2, I will not be covering. Also, I might do this in another video, unsure. But if you are interested what the brackets look like, below Platinum 2. In my experience, it looks something like this, like Iron to Silver 1, Silver 1 to Gold 2, Gold 2 to Plat 4, then Plat 4 to Platinum 2. Now today, we're going to be we're going to be covering the Diamond 4 to Diamond 2 bracket, then the Diamond 2 to Master 0 LP bracket, then the 0 to 350 LP, and 350 LP to around 600 to 800 LP. And then at the end, I will be talking about the Rank 1 players and the 1, 1K LP plus players in a, you know, one or two separate slides. Now you'll notice that I've got this big fat yellow uh, little arrow pointing to the bottom of zero, of Master T, sorry, zero LP, which I call base camp and the foot in the mountain. Don't worry about that yet. I'll get to that when we get to the, the Master T section. So stay tuned. It will all make sense as we go through this video. So let's kick it off with Diamond 4 to Diamond 2. And one thing I really need to preface this skill bracket with specifically is that I find Diamond 4 to be a very strange ELO in the sense that I look at a player a lot of the time who's Diamond 4 and I'm like, wow. I never would have thought you're Diamond 4. Like, given the way you're playing right now, how the hell did you get to Diamond 4? And I often find myself saying this. Now, I'm not saying this in a very judgmental way. It can be seen in two, both a negative or a positive light. Positive in the sense that anyone can get to Diamond 4, I believe. Like, if you really have the motivation, I truly believe anyone can get to Diamond 4. But negative in the sense that if you haven't got great fundamentals, you can still get to Diamond 4. I've seen people with shocking fundamentals still get to Diamond 4. And this is concerning because if you get to Diamond 4 like this, whether it's because if you have insane amount of champion mastery or whatever it is, you can instill some incredibly poor habits which will hurt you in the long run. And I see this all too often. Now, in this ELO bracket, there are two overarching themes. The first one is that people fail to realize how brutal the game really is. Right at this level of play, everyone has decent, uh, like a decent level of champion mastery, and you're going to find yourself getting stomped really fast or doing the stomping very fast. And sometimes all it takes is one mistake, and then the game is boom out of your control. Whereas kind of elo brackets below this, you can mess up in the early game, you can screw around, you can autopilot, and you can still largely get to diamond four or win games within high plat specifically. So this is where that really starts to shift. And the second thing I've noticed is that based off the increased level of play, people who have weak mentals really start to get weeded out and stuck at this skill bracket specifically. The amount of people that I've seen that are stuck at diamond four or between this range diamond four to diamond two, is unbelievable. This is a, a very, very uh, tough ELO bracket for the people with weak mentals to really climb through. Now, like I referred to on the previous slide, in this ELO bracket, some seriously poor habits are starting to come to the surface, both gameplay-wise, process-wise, and mentality-wise. And this is especially the case for those players that play maybe one or two champions and have just spammed hundreds or thousands of games on these one or two champions and got to Diamond 4 or Diamond 3 or Diamond 2 purely based off their levels of champions mastery, right? I'm directing this at you, one trick, maybe you're a Swain player, Vlad, Pike, Mid, Yasuo, Diana, whatever it is, Katarina, these champions are probably the most common. But the most dangerous thing about this, if you get to Diamond 4 or Diamond 3 or Diamond 2 this way, 
you are likely going to be stuck here for a very long time. And you've probably instilled some habits that are so deeply ingrained that it can take you years or an entire year straight of reflection and grinding to get out of it. And you're likely going to drop all the way back to like mid to low plat in order to get out of this, this rut. And this is what I've seen most of the time. They do go all the way down to plat four and then they climb all the way back up to diamond, really refining their fundamentals, which is sad, but it's just true. So if you haven't already decided to like really take a long, hard look at yourself and especially your solo queue improvement process, this is when I urge you to start this process. Please look at your review process. Look at the spamming of your games. Look at what do you do in between your solo queue blocks as well. Usually these sorts of the players, they don't get into the, into the details in the review. They usually spam blocks of 17. They don't take breaks in between their games. They tilt queue all the time and one mistake happens in the game and they don't take any responsibility for it and they're just going to blame everyone else around them. So please, if you haven't done this already, please go take a look at your solo queue process because I guarantee you it's going to be absolutely shocking. This is where you need to start. This is the fundamentals of digging yourself out of this hole, this right between Diamond 4 to Diamond 2. This is where it really begins. Now, one of the big misconceptions players have who are actually stuck at this ELO bracket is that they believe that it's all like this crazy macro advanced techniques that they're actually missing in their gameplay that is actually holding them back from climbing all the way past Diamond 2. But in my experience, this couldn't be further from the truth. This is not the case whatsoever. I've never watched a Diamond 4 or a Diamond 3 or even a Diamond 2 player who's like, oh, wow, they have amazing fundamentals and they're just missing all of this crazy macro mid-game lane assignments and crazy shit. That's like the reason they're Diamond 4, the reason they're Diamond 3 and they can't climb. No, the amount of Diamond 4, Diamond 3 players who I review who literally still don't do basic jungle tracking, die to, you know, 2 minute 30 ganks all the time, aren't making decisions in reference to the champion's identity, largely compensating, not warding to one side, not, not really leaning... It's mind boggling. It really is. I guarantee, I can basically guarantee you actually, if you're in this stuck in this ELO bracket, it is not, it's nothing to do with your mid to late game, crazy macro bullshit. It's all your fundamentals. I guarantee your fundamentals are terrible. Okay. So if I was stuck in this ELO bracket, I would find trends for your deaths in the first 10 minutes of the game. Tie it back. Every single one of these deaths, I guarantee you ties back to an underlying fundamental. Whether it's your poor jungle tracking, your poor leaning, your poor warding, Bad tempo assessment, terrible resets, basic lack of matchup understanding. Please stop skipping over the first 10 minutes of your review and get into the details and just end the review at one death. Please just do this. Even if you're, doing, you're going to do this for the short term, for the next three weeks, you go into review. What are the trends in that first death of the game? Are you warding at 2 minutes 30? Are you doing basic jungle tracking of their first click? Get into these details. And in, in my experience, the people at this ELO bracket refuse to do this. They refuse to get into the details because it's too painful. It's too painful to accept reality that you're actually not that good anymore and you're stuck at Diamond 4. So the other thing I've seen here and what I would recommend is refine your improvement process from top to bottom like I mentioned before. Are you playing blocks of 18 games in a row? Are you getting home from work and playing nine hours straight? What's your review process like? What are you doing in queue? Are you, you know, watching porn in queue? What are you doing in queue? What, what crazy shit are you doing? Just refine your solo queue process. Are you coming in with intensity? Are you listening to music and talking on Discord while you're playing? There's some crazy shit I've seen in this ELO bracket as well. Just absolute ba basic fundamentals of improvement. You've got to start taking it a little bit seriously. Now, the third one here, start employing more attention to detail in your reviews and gameplay. If you're going even, in the first seven minutes of the game, start to look at the quality of your aggressive posturing. Look at the quality of your leaning. Look at the quality of your resets. Start, rather than just saying, oh, look, I went even. I didn't die. I didn't do anything bad. Okay, well, I'm assuming that there is a lot more improvement in this first seven minutes if you haven't got a kill or if you haven't got a significant lead. And start figuring out what is replicable and what isn't. Don't rely on your micro anymore. Okay, if you get that random kill where the jungler just comes mid and you just pick up a random kill or you know, just just a stupid non-replicable kill. I don't care about those. What I care about is you doing the absolute, you, you have a hypothesis with the, how you're going to play the waves with the first three or four minutes of the game. You know exactly what amount of gold you ideally want to base on. You're leaning to the correct side. You had a hypothesis about where the jungler is going to be and if you could contest that 2v2 in the river. If you tick all these boxes, you'll find that 
there's a lot of things that are going to be replicable. You're going to, if I play Fizz, for example, I basically know exactly how my first, you know, six, seven minutes of the game are likely going to play out to the T. Because it's very replicable. It's all based off matchup understanding and wave management. And hold yourself to a higher standard, guys. Put emphasis on things like, you know, if you randomly blow a flash to a gank or you randomly blow a flash to a, a poor trade at level three, you should be exploding in your brain about that. Like, holy, holy moly, that was massive. It's not, the, it's not your vein not flashing the Zoe bubble at 17 minutes that lost you the game. It's you having to blow flash to the Katarina at level three because you didn't allow her to shove you in. That's what's losing you games, I guarantee you. Or if you're late to a skirmish and your jungler, you know, flames you, rather than flaming him back and blaming your bot not having priority, it's you. Why couldn't you have seen this? Could you have communicated way in advance? Could you have played your ways better? Could you have leaned better? Could you have warded better? I don't know. And remember, the game is getting more and more brutal as you climb. And what I mean by brutal is that one simple mistake or one missed opportunity or one slip up can cost you the game. This is what you really need to internalize if you're going to climb through this, this bracket. Now, moving on to Diamond 2 to Master Zero LP, there are two themes that I find that are ever present within this skill bracket. The first one is a lack of consistency. The second one is being overwhelmed. Let's start with the lack of consistency problem. My theory is that within this skill bracket, this is where people should start shifting their focus away from getting leads in the early game to exploding the enemy nexus. Right, this sounds a little bit weird, but believe me, there are a lot of players out there, and I've, I've fell in this trap as well. They get obsessed, and because you know, sometimes it's kind of my fault in the way that I talk a lot about getting ahead in the first 10 minutes, but I truly believe that is the process you have to go through. Diamond four to diamond two, you should be mastering your first 10 minutes and really get into those details within the first 10 minutes of the game, the lane fundamentals. Then, once you've got that down pat, that will get you to around Diamond 2. Now, Diamond 2 to Master, yes, all those things should largely be muscle memory. Now, we've got to start getting into the details and utilizing our lead to explode their nexus rather than just getting ourselves ahead. Now, it's more about the map, everything else that is happening around us. And these is, this is actually made up of a series of concepts. And these are the sorts of things I would go over within my coaching sessions within someone who's above Diamond 2 and looking to get to Master tier. So this is where I start to look at side lane awareness and the quality of their camera panning. Making calls in advance, revolving around objectives, what the next objective is, and actually calling lane assignments. Your awareness, or how often are you aware of your own jungler's plan and their location at all times? Do you know that your jungler is actually no HP on Krugs and is about to reset? Do you know that your jungler is about to go for an invade on that blue? You know, how aware of you of what your jungler is actually doing this game? And because if you are not, if you're not actually aware of what your jungler is doing, you're not going to be able to change your game plan or change your strategy or change the way you're trading or way or, or manipulating your wave based off this information, which can be absolutely game changing. And the fourth one here, creative picks and advanced champion mastery. That's pretty self-explanatory. La uh, largely actually removing compensation from your gameplay completely. Number six, knowing when to group versus split. This is a massive one I'll focus on. Now, this is a very difficult skill to improve on because there's no clear cut answer, right? You've got to be like Bruce Lee. You've got to be like water. You've got to adapt to the variables that are present within that game specifically. And there's a series of things I cover. Now, just I'll do it. I'll actually touch on this quickly and I'll write out some of the things that come to my mind when I think about this. Now, when you're in a game, you're going to be in some games, especially when you're in Diamond 2, where it's very fast paced, right? Your vein and or maybe your Ezreal bot lane is like playing super aggressive, trading kills is like 15 kills by eight minutes, you know, shit's happening, your bot lane's gotten caught a few times or your top lane keeps getting engaged upon. What happens in this game and when you're in a game like this, you need to process this and be like, okay, interesting. Now, if I'm at 20 minutes deciding whether I should group or split right now, I need to keep into account and keep in mind what has happened so far in this game. Is my team very conservative and understanding that they have the enemy has a lot of engage? Is this a very slow paced game? Like look at the trends, what has happened in this game specifically? And what I find people do, they have like this rigid approach. It's like, oh, okay, here, I gotta be bought, I have TP, they don't have any engage, but they, they're completely forgetting that what has happened in the game so far? What are the tendencies of the players? This is where things like assessing the mental resilience of your teammates in a way. And this kind of ties into game sense and getting a feel for the game, but this is something I will touch on. And the other things that dictate whether the group will split it, like, you know, how much engaged does the enemy composition have? How much disengaged do we have? 
um, how are the enemies actually posturing? When you pan your camera and you see your teammates, how are they posturing on the map? Are they posturing very aggressively or are they posturing very defensively? All these sorts of things. And you can really get into the details here. And maximizing the amount of pressure you're exerting on the map, especially in the side lane. And then the last one here is skirmishing. Now, believe it or not, um, climbing from Diamond 2 to Master Deer is an absolute shit show. It is messy. It's dirty. It is really a, a very difficult thing for a lot of people. And skirmishing is one of those skills that you really got to develop. And the most toxic thing that I see when people try to climb through Diamond 2 to Master Zero LP is that they do the early game really well, they'll get a lead, they'll do all the fundamentals, and then they just go to this crazy chaotic river skirmish, they'll mis-execute their kit or their ability, whatever, whatever they do, and they die and they throw their lead. And sometimes that can be literally all it takes for them to lose that game. And that can really play will have a really negative effect on a lot of people's mental state. And there's no other way around it. Skirmishing is brutal and it's a natural part of the game. And you've got to put a massive emphasis on it within your own reviews. How are you using your abilities? Did you correctly identify the key threats on the enemy team? Did you identify your role in the comp and how your champion needed to position and fight? Did you need to peel? Did you need to dive? Did you need to be at the objective early? What was it that made, what are the trends as to why you're losing skirmishes or why you're winning skirmishes? What are you doing well and what are you doing poorly? This is where a lot of people mess up. And this is actually where, guys, the main issue starts. And this is where a lot of uh, toxic stuff really starts to build up here. Now, because we're starting to refine a lot of these smaller details and elements of the game, our focus is partially stepping away from the fundamentals. VOD reviews are less about, you know, here I didn't water 230 or I should be leaning to my vision. That stuff is largely just muscle memory or something that you don't really need to direct much attention onto anymore. But as we start to direct our focus away from these fundamentals, because in the past we we're getting rewarded from it. It's like, oh, Curtis is telling me I got to do all these lane fundamentals. Now I'm getting leads all the time. It's very replicable and I'm largely winning games. Steam rolling through Diamond 3, Diamond 2, and making my way through to Master Zero LP, and we start to get into really all these details like I mentioned on the previous slide, we actually start to get a little bit more shaky on our basics again. Tying back to my mental stack video, you've probably watched it, I think I believe it's in my Why People Get Hard Stuck set, uh, video, where like you're trying to add something new. So let's just say I've never thought about processing my jungler's location. Or I've never thought about painting my camera to side lanes. If I'm trying to make that a skill and really add that into my arsenal, now something else is going to be shaky. All the other things that I'm thinking about, something has got to come out or loosen or I'm going to get worse at maybe jungle tracking slightly. Or I'm going to forget to jungle track that one time or forget to get a good quality tempo reset or forget to lean to my vision here or forget to put a ward down. And this is where things really start to get a bit messy. Right, so for example, a player who could previously ward, lean, trade consistently is now actually sometimes slipping up, forgetting to lean and die to ganks. Now this actually brings about a massive form of inconsistency, which can, which can oftentimes bring a lot of frustration and tilt. The player who was once dominating in low diamond is now losing to high diamonds, not just because they're being outclassed in the small details, but because they are now making basic mistakes as well. It's a combination of not knowing these small details and making the basic mistakes. And this will often cause massive loss streaks and swings in LP. Now, once these swings and inconsistencies start to occur, the player is often incentivized to play more. It's like, I've got to play more games, right? I've got to, I've got to make up for these losses. And generally, this will usually result in a loss of schedule and, this, and the beginning the process of spamming games. I've, I haven't really met a player yet who's actually able to stay disciplined and be like, you know, no matter what, I made some basic mistakes this game. These aren't even my learning objectives, but you know what? I'm going to stay the course. I'm going to continue to focus on these small details and keep at it. Because as we know, guys, the spamming of games drastically reduces the intensity of our gameplay and overall levels of focus. Now, this also has a massive negative effect on our gameplay itself. So let's actually, before we go on any further, let's actually summarize where we're at right now, all right? So number one, we begin to learn and focus on these new small details. So maybe you, your learning objective is like I said, pan your camera more to side lanes, or are calling lane assignments, or thinking about the next objective, or processing your jungle's location, or whatever it is. Now, because you're focusing on this, sometimes the fundamentals, you're going to forget some absolute basics, right? So there's going to be a loss of consistency in these fundamentals due to the mental stack, leading to a series of basic mistakes. Now, this is where the frustration or tilt really comes into play, leading to worse gameplay. Then you play more, right? You're spamming games, which leads to a loss of focus, loss of intensity, which has even worse gameplay. 
And then it's just a never ending cycle of frustration, lack of patience, um, lack of confidence, and so on and so forth. Now, as the player gets more and more overwhelmed with the constant focus on small details, they realize how little they know, right? They go from having a massive ego, right? When you first get to like Diamond 4, you're like, holy crap, I'm so good at the game. And you're climbing through Diamond 4 all the way to Diamond 2. You think you're the top of the world. You're stomping people in low Diamond now because you're starting to really get into the details and know how to replicate getting ahead due to solid fundamentals. But due to losing more and more, or more often than not, Sometimes my coaching, as we go through this process, they actually start to feel worse about where they're at. They're like, holy shit, there's actually so many things missing from my gameplay that, oh my God, I actually realize I'm actually not that good anymore. They go from being on the top of the world to just through, through the, to the earth's core. They're just done, right? And these negative emotions and pressure is then exacerbated as they need closer and closer to master tier. Because we all know when you get close to promos, or specifically these players who've been aiming for master tier for sometimes even years, the closer they get, the more they turn their focus from focusing on the improvement to just purely focusing on the LP, right? Let's just say they get to diamond 150 LP, they're like, oh my god, two more games or three more games, I mean my promos. And then they get to their promos, they're not thinking about improvement or their learning objectives or anything. All they want to do is win that game. And then we know if you lose one of those games or you lose that promo or you demote back to Diamond 2, brings about more tilt, worse quality reviews, and an insane amount of pressure. And if you have this pressure on yourself, I haven't known a single player yet that has actually risen to the occasion, stayed disciplined throughout this process, and haven't just put a massive emphasis on just reaching master tier. This, this amount of pressure is it's unreasonable. You can't climb, you can't improve when you're putting this massive amount of pressure on yourself. And it's funny, like me reading and going through all this, like even now, right? I'm thinking to myself, holy moly, why does this climb feel so hard, right? Because this is just what I've seen in my experience. I've seen this entire process again and again and again. This is not just like one or two people. This is a constant reoccurring trend. But more often than not, what I've actually realized like making this video is that the people that are in this skill bracket, they're their own worst enemies in the sense that if they didn't have such inflated egos, delusional narratives about how good they were with a consistent improvement schedule and focus on the details within the course of a few months, the climb is actually relatively straightforward in my opinion. Like if you really get into the details, have a great consistency, great discipline, great review process, solid process overall, you're going to get through it relatively easily. And this is all self-inflicted and it's all in their own control. And I actually find coaching people at this bracket the most challenging because of all these mental blocks and things like that. But it's actually the most fun because it's like a it's like a miniature drama series. It's like one day they're like on the top of the world, like, oh my God, Curtis, now I know how to do this. And then we focus on the next thing and then they're down again, they're losing. It's like a drama, right? It's like one of those like Korean dramas or some shit. I don't know. Um, now, if I haven't already removed all this toxic stuff throughout the climb from Diamond 4 to Diamond 2, this is all like more the process stuff, I work on removing the rest of these bullshit toxic views around the game, removing mental blocks, and fixing poor in-game habits throughout this Diamond 2 to Master 0 LP skill bracket. And these are the th sorts of things I try to work on. You know, and I call them out and I really bring them to the surface. Some people I've found have like this weird narrative where it's like, oh my god, this champion is just OP, I can't deal with it, they're too much, I don't know how to beat it. Most notably, champions like Kassadin, Vlad, Yone, and Hecarim I seem to be the most common. The next one is that people fail to identify that they aren't the win condition tying into losing gracefully, right? They refuse to get carried. If they die once or twice, yes, because they probably know now how much that means. They're starting to get to the point where they realize, oh my god, if I die here... This game is largely over, like I've messed up, you know, I can't, my team's not going to carry me, you know, that sort of thing. And then they start to get in the head and instead of losing gracefully, identifying the fact that someone else in the team is actually quite fed and they can just take a back seat and, and compliment that member, they try to make up for it. They try to solo kill again and get back into the game, which actually exacerbates them being behind and they don't really, ref or they actually basically refuse to get carried. And this is just nonsense. Sometimes you're going to get counted in the draft. And your goal or your role in that game is to get carried. It's a skill to lose gracefully. It's a skill within itself. And I've talked about this within one of my previous videos. Typing nonsense in chat, passive aggression, bullshit, toxic pinging, 
um, that sort of thing. Obsessions over win rates, teammates, OPGGs, blaming MMR, dealing with insecurities around their level of play, usually due to realizing how little they know, like I mentioned before. Overcomplicating the learning process, usually seen by constant shifting of champion pools and blaming their champion as to the reason why they're at this ELO bracket. And the last one here, being allergic to getting into the details in their own review, usually resulting in poor result or poor quality reviews, leading to blaming of other teammates and failing to take responsibility of their gameplay. If I hear a person at any level, but specifically this level say, you know, the reason I lost was X, Y, Z, someone else, this person did this, they did this. What's the point of saying that? At the end of the day, you didn't play flawlessly, did you? It's just a waste of time. It's a mental, waste of mental energy. Just get into the details and figure out what you can take away from it. And yes, this requires a lot of discipline, but if you can't do this now, then you're never going to make it past Master Tier 0 LP anyway. So you might as well develop this skill now. Now I'm going to be covering how to go about climbing from Master Tier 0 LP to around 350-ish LP. And this is actually where most people choose to give up. Right, we see hundreds of Smurf accounts speed run to the bottom of Master Tier with super sick, cool, no scope win rates, and then they rinse and repeat this process. Right, they get to Master Tier, they're like, screw this, this is too hard. And they get their buddy, they duo, and then they just go again and again, stomping through golds and platinums and low diamonds with their sick win rates, and then they just give up, or they sell the account, or, the, or then, or they actually try to climb, then they give up when they start ruining their win, win rates. This is a common occurrence and it's absolutely ridiculous. And the main reason we see this in my opinion is because this is an incredibly hard section to climb, especially if it's your first time to master tier. And I actually refer to master tier zero LP as base camp because of how large the climb is from this point onwards. And this is where, in my opinion, my, in my theory that the game of league actually starts. And this may seem incredibly egotistical and a, a little bit judgmental, but let me just back up my point here. I want to talk about this in reference to football. In Europe, they call it football. In America, I think you guys call it soccer. Same as Australia, we call it soccer. Let's, let's actually break down, break this down with a little analogy here. Let's just say we have two players here. We have player A and we have player B. And this is soccer. And they have a little, they have a little football here. And player B um, passes the ball to player A a hundred times. Now, let's just say this guy is very good at soccer and he actually hits the target from a pretty far distance away. 98 or 99 times out of 100. Now, if these guys, or you had a full team of these sorts of players, then when you watch that game of soccer, you're not really going to look for who makes the most mistakes, or the team that's going to win isn't going to be the team that, you know, makes the least mistakes. The team that wins that game is going to be the one that has the best strategy. Conversely, if we were to have two players here, where we've got, again, player A and player B over here, these are nice little stick figures, and player B... Let's just say his skill level is at where if he passes the ball to player A here 100 times, he maybe only hits the target 65 or 70% of the time, or 70 out of those 100 times. Now, if you were to watch a game of soccer play out with this sort of or this caliber of players, well, generally the strategy is going to be who makes the least mistakes is going to win the game. Generally, this is the sort of thing you see. Now, once you get to Master Tier 0 LP, you can't afford to just sit back and rely on other people's mistakes anymore. So what we see is that in order to climb from Master, zero, Master Tier 0 LP onwards is that we're not looking for the player with the best fundamentals. Everyone has solid fundamentals. We're looking for the smartest player, the, people, the person who makes the best proactive play, the person who makes the best creative play, the person who executes and does that next level thing. So this is where league actually starts because we're not we're not watching a game of league where oh they win because that guy just messed up a basic skill shot or or you know fat fingered his flash or whatever it is. We're really playing league right now, and that's the way I like to view this specific bracket of of skill. And Nice, I, I might be quoting this wrong, but he actually talks about how he recommends a lot of people to quit at this point. Once they get to Master Zero LP, I might be wrong. Maybe he says Diamond One or Master Zero LP. I don't know. But if he did say Master Tier 0 LP, then I tend to agree with him. I believe that this is where people should start to be a little bit more, at least put some thought into it, whether they should continue or not, because this is a massive climb and a big, big commitment. The average person shouldn't really be trying to climb this if they're not, or climb this bracket, if they're not willing to put in a, a disproportionate amount of time. Now, one of the biggest reasons we actually see this Smurf phenomenon all the way, you know, getting to bottom of Master and then rinse repeating is because it's very painful to accept reality that there are many people that are way better than you. Because when you start to play into Master and you pop into, say, a 300 LP or a 400 LP player, you, you get stomped. 
like you get absolutely dominated. And the gap between a zero LP master player and say a 500 LP grand master player, in my experience, even like taking this, talking about this conservatively, is at least platinum two to diamond two, at a minimum, probably if not more. But we have to remember guys, and I don't wanna, you know, I, I don't wanna be too negative here. We have to remember that getting to master D is a massive achievement. Like it's not many people can do this. This is a very big achievement. But because you get this achievement, when you make this achievement, you know in the back of your mind, well, I'm probably the best in my school now. I'm probably the best in my college, out of my friendship group. This feels amazing. But oftentimes it brings about an ego, right? And this is the rank where ego and insecurity turns people to the dark side. Believe it or not, this is just what I've seen. And you know, I, I hear people in Diamond say, oh my God, people have massive egos. Wait till you get to this ELO bracket. This is where egos actually just get absolutely out of control. Instead of these players trying to push to the higher rank, it feels better for them to stomp diamonds or platinums or golds because this reinforces the image that they are a great player and that all of the effort they put in to get to the bottom of master was worth it, right? Why would I bother getting stomped by grand masters when I know I can have fun smurfing with my 65 or 70% win rate to master D0 LP? It's too painful to do the other thing. I don't want to get stomped by a grand master. Why would I want to do that when I can smurf on all these people? It feels amazing, right? This ego and insecurity really starts to take over. But moving on from this anyway, given a player is actually dedicated to improvement and chooses to climb, I found the theme of this skill bracket to be refinement and optimization. Refinement in all areas now begins. So let's just say, you know, we can actually get to zero LP with say 75% fundamentals. All of our fundamentals are about 75% consistent. Now we're taking all of our, all these concepts, we're taking them all the way to around 85 to 90%. We're just leveling them up, taking them up a notch right now. Okay, and so if we think back to the diamond two to master tier bracket, I generally focus less on the laning phase and more about those detailed complex concepts. But once we get to master tier, I shift it again. I actually shift the focus completely back onto micro and laning in the first 10 minutes. So let me actually just expand on why I do this. If the problem was with your translation of leads or some basic macro concept, it would have already been exposed by now. All of that stuff, like you should have that knowledge by now. The difference at these levels, at this levels in my experience, is actually been largely micro, clicking quality, tethering differences. When I verse a low master player, I don't win because I know more stuff, or I know much more about the macro, or I know more about the matchup or whatever. It's simply because I land my cue and they miss theirs. That's it. My clicking's better, my micro's better, and my tethering's better. Yes, I might be better in some other areas, but that's not the main reason I win. So what I do, I try to go back to this. I try to go back to the micro and focus on the micro, the, lane, the really specifics within the lane in the first 10 minutes. In the past, I thought this wasn't fixable, right? I thought this wasn't fixable. I thought I was capped. When my micro was bad, I thought that was it. I could not climb anymore. But upon my own learning journey, I've actually proven to myself and through my, you know, I've actually improved my micro ability and I've actually done this within one of my previous videos and I've shared that story, um, but it's more, more than doable. Anyone can do this. And the reason improving your micro is doubly important is that at this level of play, if you're getting outclassed in the first 10 minutes, it means way more than it does in every other ELO bracket because junglers really know how to snowball leads, laners really know how to run away with leads, and a single one skirmish in a river can be all it takes to win the game. That's it. You go into a river skirmish and you miss your Zoe bubble, done. Sometimes the game is completely out of your control now, or you go into a river skirmish or back up your jungler for an invade and you're playing Syndra and you miss your stun, done. The game's over like that sometimes. And that's the, how brutal the game really gets to this level of play. But outside of the micro improvement aspect of climbing through this bracket, I begin to ensure that every each and every decision made is actually made with intention. Like you know why you're doing it, right? If I ask you, if I ask a client of this ELO bracket, why did you do this with the wave? And they can't answer. They say, they, they say, I don't know. Or I said, why did you reset here? They say, I'm actually not sure. Then that's a problem. And that's where I really start to get into the details and pinpoint specifically, each and every decision must be made with intention. Okay, that's where I really start to, to put in a lot of work. Now remember, this process of climbing through zero LP to 350 LP is not sexy at all. It is an absolute grind. And we are now playing at a level where it's actually less about the mistakes we are making that is actually losing us games. It's more about the missed opportunities that we aren't taking that is actually losing us games. We are now in the optimization business rather than the learning business. 
It's very rare that I look at a review in this level of play where, oh, you just died to a two minute 30 gank or you didn't, you didn't lean to a ward or you didn't do basic jungle tracking. That's the reason you lost. No. It's largely, oh, interesting. I actually completely mismanaged this wave. I, like, I had an intention or I had a hypothesis about this matchup, but my hypothesis was actually wrong. And I could, I could have actually optimized my positioning in the lane or optimized my, my game plan to actually bring about a much bigger lead. Now, that's what I'm looking for when I'm at this ELO bracket. And the other thing as well, champion pools actually start to be optimized here as well. I don't talk about, I don't like talking about champion pools at all. Um, I don't really like talking about them because I feel like it's a cop-out and champion mastery really trumps everything. But as you start to climb through to grandmaster and challenger, champion pools really do um, kind of come into play and start to be quite relevant. So if you're not at this level yet, I wouldn't really worry about champion pools. But yes, I would uh, start to worry about your champion pool when you're at this ELO bracket specifically. Lastly, this is a bracket where watching point of view VODs of players like Knight and Dopa really come into play more so than any other rank. In lower ranks, you're going to be able to look at a VOD, whether it's I break down a pro play inside or you watch a mid beast thing or whatever you watch. And either one or two things is going to happen. You're going to see the small micro aspects and be like, whoa, that's like cool. But they're not relevant to you because you can't even execute upon them anyway, or you straight up don't even notice them anyway. You literally just don't even notice them, or they just weren't meaningful to you. Now, at this level of play, you're going to start to realize, holy shit, I now realize how good Knight is. Or oh, wow, this actually makes sense why Dopa is this good. Like, you're starting to see all these little details and notice them in the VOD review. Wow, they, the way they play is just beautiful. And you start to see all these intricacies in their movements and their game plans that this is going to really help you level up your game. So let's actually go into actually what I would look for if I were to go into these VOD reviews. Now, your intention when looking at these VODs is to compare. And you want to compare with your gameplay with the way they play the matchup. Not really in a judging way, but... And, and not even in a way where they're automatically correct. Like you can't come in with the mentality that every single thing that Dopa does is correct and I'm just going to mindlessly copy. No, sometimes they do make mistakes or there's room for improvement. So you've got to come in with a very inquisitive and, and looking at a very objectively approach. And you might actually be playing a certain aspect of that lane better. I've seen many a times where I watch a Mango Fish uh, Fizz VOD and I'm like, there is no way this is the most optimal way to play the matchup. And I've played the matchup differently and had much more success. Maybe he's getting away with it because he has good micro or whatever reason it is. Don't automatically expect that every single thing they do is correct. Because a lot of the time they're playing on stream as well. And they might just kind of be playing for fun. So a question I urge you to ask yourself when you're watching these VODs is, why do they do what they do? Not what they're doing, but why? What's the underlying concept? What are they trying to get out of this by making this decision? Why are they positioning the way they are? And so I'll get into the specifics of why they do or don't touch the CS. There usually is a reason why they're not touching that CS or they are touching that CS. This includes faking CS, giving CS, contesting CS. Specifically, how they use an ability. I actually found the way Dopa uses his W, like when I actually watched and I got specific on the way he used his W, um... I got really into the detail and I'm like, wow, I was using my W wrong the whole time. And then when I really got into the details and studying the, how he uses W specifically, then I was able to level up my level of play a lot. The way they position in lane in reference to the enemy's location. Lane positioning, you'll notice the higher you get through this rank, becomes more and more important. How good quality your tethering is. And this includes really understanding perceived threat, faking ability usage, how they create space with the way they're posturing level one, level two, all the way through their entire early laning phase. This is very, very important. Number four, what sort of recalls do they take and why? And how does this tie into the game pace? What, what sort of game pace are they looking for? How often are they using their abilities? What sort of recalls are they going for? And why is this even the case in the first place? Has this anything to do with the 1v1 matchup? Or is this because they're playing at this rank and the jungle matchup is like Shaco versus Rek'Sai? I don't know. Get into the details. And why they choose to roam versus not roam. And the last one here is in-depth looking at skirmishing and team fighting and how are they specifically using their abilities differently to you? One thing that I've done a lot when I'm, you know, climbing through, you know, 500p actually onwards is I have learning objectives specifically on an ability and the way they use your ability. Sometimes I'll come into a game and I'm like, okay, I'm going to focus on using my Echo W in this way. It's a very small detail, but you'll notice in skirmishes and team fighting, a lot of the time when I watch a mango fish, the lane is very similar to how I'll play it, but he just plays the skirmishes 10x better than me. His skirmishing is on another level. So then I'll get into the details and look, okay, what makes his skirmishing so much better? 
is he using his abilities differently? Is he coming to fights from a different position? Like, how is he interpreting these fights different to me? So really getting into that nitty gritty around skirmishing and team fighting can really uh, pay dividends in the long run. Now I'm gonna be covering what it takes to go from around 350 LP to approximately 600 to 800 LP, which is sometimes low challenger, mid challenger, or high grandmaster, given, or you know, really depending on the server differences. Now this is actually the bracket where two elements really come to the forefront more so than anything else. Number one, out of game factors, and number two, mental resilience and confidence specifically. Now this is something that's really weird and you're gonna think there's no way this is true. But I've thought about this a long time and it just is, it's just a little bit weird. I've spoken to a bunch of other people who've had very similar experiences to me. We've all found that climbing from around 700 LP onwards or 700 to 900 specifically is actually easier than going from 300 to 600. And I always thought to myself, how can this be the case? Why does it feel easier? So I've dwelled on this for a while now, and I kind of want to share with you guys what I've come up with, what my conclusions are, and really break down what might be happening here. Now, when you are starting to climb from 350 LP onwards, you begin to verse very good players for the first time. When you're like low master or low grand master, you're just not versing many pro players. You don't come up against them very often. But as you start to get through 350 LP onwards, you start to come across more and more pro players. And you know all of this, you know who they are. You know who this pro player is. You're like, oh, okay, that guy, he plays for X team, that guy plays for Y team, so on and so forth. And because they're pro players and they spend a lot of time playing the game literally every single day, you respect them or you naturally respect them. And this takes a big toll on your mental. You're not just versing the average Joe blog now. You are versing known players who are proven, you know are good, and you actually respect them. And this is where your self-confidence really starts to take a hit because you're just not used to this. Now, if you somehow get through this onslaught and you manage to come out the other side around 700 LP and become a quote-unquote respected member of the challenger ladder and you start to see yourself performing well in these high-quality games, you get massive boosts in self-confidence, way more than any other rank. So by the time you get through this other side, you get to 600 or 700 LP, you know deep down that you already have the ability to compete. You know there's not a big difference between you and that pro player. You know that there's only small little things you need to refine. You have the confidence in yourself. Not because you know you're better or anything, but you know you just have the ability to compete. But when you're doing this for the first time and you're at 350 LP, you just don't have that self-confidence because you haven't done it before. And it's we're, 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 char we're going through uncharted territory. So that's why I've actually realized once you get to 600, 700, that's why it feels much better to go from that to like 900 because you're like, oh wow, okay, I should believe in myself now. It's actually doable. But before it seems like an impossible task. Now dealing with these self-confidence issues, going through the skill bracket along the way, in my eyes is actually the hardest bit. It's not the difference in the micro or the matchup understanding or differences in champion mastery, although yes, they are significant factors. It's largely this difference in self-confidence and you guys all know it. It doesn't even have to be 350 to 600 LP. If you go into a game, whether you're a Platinum 2 versus a Diamond 4, or you're a Diamond 2 versus a Master T0 LP, if you go into that game and you know that player, or you respect that player, or you're scared of that player, you are going to play significantly worse. So I'm convinced that along my journey, why this was so much harder wasn't because I was missing a lot of these details, although that may have been a contributing factor. It was largely the lack of confidence that was holding me back from ultimately improving at the end of the day. And we have to remember, guys, yes, there's going to be differences in your micro, match on understanding, champ mastery, etc. But think of it as levels, like I mentioned before. Before we were going to say 75 to 85, now we're going from 90 to 95% confidence in all of these areas. Now, the reason confidence is so important at the end of the day is because regardless of what you know, how smart you are, how capable you are, at the end of the day, you need to be able to execute upon that. You can be the best mechanical player on the server or with the best macro and know exactly what to do and know how to get into the review, whatever. But if you're terrified of versing X pro player, it doesn't mean shit. Because at the end of the day, it comes down to execution. And this lack of self-confidence is going to be ultimately hurting your ability to execute. So you may ask then, Curtis, how would you develop this confidence if you're just getting destroyed by these great players? How the hell do you develop the confidence in the first place? This is a great question. Now, I realized that the confidence actually can't come from your results or even your performance against these players. It actually has to come from the confidence in your processes and your approach to the game. If you solely try to gain confidence from beating these players, it's it's really just not going to work. Unless you're you know you're naturally gifted and you've got a lot of natural talent and you've got this innate skill, then sure. 
but that's just not, that's not replicable. That's not replicable for the average person. And that's not what I did. I knew for me personally, if I mindlessly played the game, I'm never going to be able to compete against these players. I don't have the same levels of natural talent. I'm past my prime in the world of gaming. I'm 25, I'm turning 26 this year, right? So I had to start refining my approach to the game. And this is where the out of game stuff becomes super important because I knew deep down if I could master my process, get very good at improvement, get very good at learning, learning how to learn, then I was unstoppable. And this is where I started to look into my schedule. What allowed me to have the mo the max amount of focus? What allowed me to have the max amount of intensity? How could I optimize my review process to get faster at it or more efficient or get simplified or get more learning out of the VODs? Instead of watching hours upon hours of pro VODs, what do I need to be looking for these VODs specifically? What am I looking for? All of these things start to become more important. What was my physical health like and my sleep? What was my relationship with myself like? I was starting to become more aware of a lot of these other things that I just completely left to the wayside. Now, the other element that really helped me develop self-confidence was getting into the review. In 2015 and 2016, when I was quite high elo, I was 1000 LP or something, and I was actually a pro player for Dire Wolves. If I lost a high rank challenger game or I lost a competitive game, I would get pissed off. I would get tilted easily. I would get angry. I would blame my teammates. I would just feel like shit. And reflecting on it, like really reflecting on my past, I realized that the main reason I had these reactions is because I didn't know why I was losing. I wasn't getting into the review and actually pinpointing specifically why I was dying or why I was getting out traded or why this guy was so good. If I or someone said, oh, you know, that guy's so good or we lost and we're pissed off, we're just going to say things like this. Oh, yeah, he, that guy's just a natural, or, or, or at least thinking this mentally, that guy's just a naturally talented mid laner. He's just insane or he's just an alien. He's so good at Zoe, you know. But now, if I get into the review, I can pinpoint specifically why this pro player or this really good player beat me. Oh, interesting. He actually hit the wave level one, which allowed him to slow build in this. Oh, I didn't ward here. Or he was heavy leaning. Or he, I wasn't faking enough CS and I didn't dodge these skill shots. Like, it's specific. It makes sense. There's no magical reason why he's better than me. It's not like he's, he's got more damage just because he's, playing, he's good at the game. No. It's just get into the details. There's always a reason. And yes, it's not even about the specifics here. It's about the mentality of knowing that there is a reason. Right? And to get specific, you need, and when you get specific, sorry, you can use this as a tool to develop self confidence, knowing that if you get into the review, there is always a core reason. Don't fall into the trap of just saying this sort of thing. Before you comment anything about their level of play or how good they are or whatever, get into the review. Make it very, very specific, all right? Now, as a final point, and this is actually more in reference to the people that are looking to climb to 800 LP plus, I actually kind of wanted to share my points around the scary high impact player theory. Now, this is something that I haven't mentioned before, and I've been a little bit afraid to talk about this because it's it's hard to articulate. And if there's anyone who is watching this video that is high challenger and they're watching this, they will probably understand what I'm trying to say. So please bear with me if I struggle to articulate this. Certain players have an aura. When you verse a player, this level of player, you verse like this 1000 LP player or this really good pro player. We're not just talking about the average pro player, like this very good pro player. They have like this, this aura of versing with them when you verse them, sorry. And in O's history, there's been a few. Just to name a few, there was one called Radia, King's one of them now in C9 Academy, Fudge of C9, Fantix was another one, Ryoma, you know, he was playing for 100 Thieves. And there was a few more, but these are the ones that really come to mind. And these players, they just felt like they did more. Like in every aspect, it doesn't matter if they're behind or ahead, they just did more. They were terrifying to verse and they were amazing, amazing solo queue players. And I actually contribute this to a few things. One, they had an incredibly clear understanding of how to actually explode a nexus. It's a given that they're going to get ahead in lane. It's a skill in itself to know specifically step by step what you need to do, what is going to increase your chances of killing the enemy nexus. Right? Do you need to reset right now so that we can go to get this Rift held on spawn? Whatever it is, they just know exactly what to do next. They are resource vacuums, know how to get the max amount of farm off the map without really not, or, or, and making sure to actually attend every single fight and understand the importance of farming re really, really well. They short call and actually demand how the team plays the game. King was the best at this. I remember King Destiny used to duo. And in solo queue, they would like kill bot twice or whatever it was. They would break the tower and they'll literally be typing in chat. King would be typing chat, do this, mid go here, you go here, group on this. They'll literally be typing out exactly what the team needed to do. 
literally step by step, essentially micromanaging, not just their lane. It's a given that they're going to get ahead. They're telling everyone exactly what to do. They demanded it. And they held themselves to an incredibly high standard, attention to detail. They knew the intricacies of many matchups across multiple roles. This was, which was also interesting, Fantix especially. What made Fantix so special? And even King, a lot of these players, they knew so much about multiple roles. They could tell you how Camille versus Aurelia was going to play out, even though he was a mid laner. They could, he could tell you the way bot lane was going to play out, even though he, he didn't even play that lane. He just had knowledge about, King, King did the same thing. They had knowledge about the game, which allowed them to, to increase the quality of their decisions within the game itself as well. And they also all, always had champion ocean, so they could pick for the comp flawlessly. If their comp needed CC, or the damage spread wasn't right, or whatever it is, they had champion oceans to always fill the fill the holes, which is something that um, I think was very special to them as well. And the last one here was that they scanned the map like a robot. Like, they're constantly scanning the map for information. They're never... Um, they're looking for any little bit of information. If the jungle shows topside, boom, they're doing something with it. If they see, if they know that the enemy watered this location, they're going to ping the location, know exactly when it's going to die, so they can do something with it. If they just scan the map in, to an insane degree. Now, a lot of this just sounds really pointless to highlight, right? Like, Curtis, what the hell are you talking about? Why even talk about this? But the one massive takeaway I got from not only versing these players, but working with them, right? So I coach Fantix, I, I coach King on Direwolves, um, was their aggressive mentality while playing the game itself. And this is, again, a little bit hard to articulate, but I'm going to really do my best job. And in order to really explain what I mean by this, um, I want to talk about Michael Jordan because I think he is the closest thing I can get to really articulating this. There's, for, the, for those of you who probably watched Last Dance or read Tim Grover's book, his personal trainer, there's so many stories about Michael Jordan and how he just wanted all the resources, especially early on in his career. He had this very aggressive, he just wanted the ball, him, him, him. And he would say things like, and it was one time, it was like overtime or whatever it was, and he had to hit the shot. He's like, give me the ball and get the fuck out of the way. And that's kind of the mentality these players had. When I was working with Fantix and King, it's just like, give me the ball and get the fuck out of the way. I don't care about anyone else in this solo queue game. It's like, I know that I can carry this game every single game. I know what I need to do. There is no hesitation. They have this aggressive mentality where it's like, give me, me, come gank me. It's just like, it's this very controlling, confident way of playing the game that I truly believe that the difference between a lot of these players at 800 LP onwards, the difference between like an 800 LP and 1100 LP really isn't their just level of play. The level of play is incredibly similar. There's maybe small little details, but this mentality, aggressive mentality, um, I think is a massive contributor. And these players have a hunger that is just different to the average player. And this hunger flows onto every aspect of the game. And if I were making that journey, maybe I'm a young player and I want to go pro, I want to climb to top 10 or rank one, this entire mental aspect of the game would be a massive part I look into alongside the obvious, you know, require, you know, required attention to detail. And something I noticed, and this was one thing that um, I noticed myself and why I probably never was the greatest pro player. I had one of these invisible narratives where I didn't have this. I didn't have this, this aggressive mentality, give me the ball, get the fuck out of the way. I had this invisible narrative where I was going to be the best mid laner that didn't want any resources. Like, okay, everyone else, like I'm going to be the most self-sufficient independent mid laner. But what I realized, this actually hurt me in the long run. Because in order to be the best player, you have to know when you should and shouldn't take resources. When you needed to carry, you need to be there. You got to be, and and if people are unsure, give me the resources. So um, again, I feel like this is something that's hard to articulate, but I really wanted to talk about it. Now I want to end the video by talking about a few invisible narratives and misconceptions. And for these, for the people specifically climbing from diamond to master tier, these are the trends that I've actually seen. Um, number one. Failing to internalize that the game is not about finding mistakes anymore as much as it is finding missed opportunities. And this is really difficult, right? very, very difficult because you got to take full responsibility for a game. It's going to be so easy to go into the review and go to like that six minutes uh, scenario where the jungler gave your mid laner double buffs. It's going it's to be so easy or where you died to that gank at five minutes. Right? It's not about these mistakes anymore, though. Yes, these are obvious and these are relevant, of course. But it's what's happening in between these moments. What are all the opportunities that I missed? How could I have played, even though this went even or even pretty good, how could I have played it better? What's the next level to this? If I played this to 90% perfection, how could I bring that up to 98% or 95% or 100%? How could I have played this flawlessly? If an AI robot or faker played this, how would this play out? And that's a very difficult thing to internalize. And I feel like people have this invisible narrative where it's all about mistakes, but that's just not the case. 
The second one here is failing to understand that one misplayed skirmish is all it takes to lose a game. I keep saying this within the Midland Academy. It's not 20 minute, this 20 minute reason why you lose the game. It's nothing to do with that, okay? That one skirmish where you and your jungler died to, in that, that thing because you just didn't ma manage the wave properly or whatever it is, that's the main reason. That's the main takeaway here. Don't expect to win after you've made these core mistakes in the first 10 minutes of the game. Or that one skirmish at seven minutes that you screwed up, or that one river skirmish at level level four. That is where you need to direct your attention and really get into the details. And no tea, get specific on what is going wrong with your skirmishing. And because this is the easy thing that people, and I've actually made this mistake in the past, right? Let's just say skirmishing you've identified as a problem with your gameplay. Like I mentioned earlier on, you've got to get even more granular. What specifically is happening in, in these skirmishes? Are you always rocking up late? Are you not identifying your role in these skirmishes? Are you not identifying the key threat from the enemy team? Did you not identify that the enemy had a combat spell whereas you had TP? Could you have called off this skirmish way in advance? Could you have manipulated your wave to get faster to this skirmish? Could you have actually foreseen this skirmish happening based off the jungle tracking? Were you not... Um, were you using your abilities in an incorrect way? There has to be something specifically in terms of trends that is making your skirmish go wrong. Maybe it's not just one thing, it could be multiple things, but again, you must get into the detail. And um, every ranked match with a master player in it is a special event. For the diamond players specifically, you know, especially as you get to diamond two onwards, you see a master player on the enemy team, they're like, oh my god, everyone, get the popcorn, get the fireworks, get the, the party poppers, this is crazy, I'm versus a master tier player now. No, there's really not that much difference, guys. Yes, there's a little bit of a difference, but again, every game must be like you're training in the dojo, nothing special, same process, same review process. You're only playing your three or four block. Get Just, just get into the process. Don't make a certain game a special little celebration. Now for some final notes and thoughts, guys. Seriously reconsider and question if climbing past master is something you want to do. I don't think it is for everyone, so really put some thought into that. I think Nice really put that... Um, very well because you got to be careful or at least aware of the sacrifices required sometimes we forget actually what made the game fun in the first place it doesn't mean you need to keep playing ranked and smurf it just means maybe you want to play a bunch of a ramps or just stick at that level of play and be happy with the way you're playing or get to master tier every season then do something else or play flex or clash whatever you want to do what makes the game fun for you and another thing that really helped me and guide my process what got me here won't get me there Okay, I can't continue the same process going from Diamond 1 to 350 LP and expect to get the same results all the way to 600 LP. No, likely I'm going to have to shift my learning objectives, my approach to the game, some of my champion pool. Something has to change. You're not going to be able to do the same thing and keep improving again and again and again. What got you here won't get you there. That's a really, really basic way of viewing it, but it did help me. And take time to pat yourself on the back along the way, guys. Even making it to Diamond 4 is an amazing accomplishment, right? You're already in the top, like, what, like 2% of players or whatever it is. It's insane. Well done. You're in the top very few percent of players. So make sure you pat yourself on the back along the way and don't just always compare yourself to that rank 1 player. Again, give props to yourself. It's a very difficult thing to do. We forget how much effort and time it even takes to get to Diamond 4. Very, very important. So good luck on your climb, guys. Hopefully this sheds a little bit of insight into some of the things you may come across on your climb to Challenger. Um, again, these are just my experiences coaching and climbing it myself. So hopefully, again, this helps you out. And cheers, and I'll see you guys around the comment section.